Hello again and welcome once more here to our class. Uh, what we're going to be doing in this module is really um, building on our discussion from last time. Uh, last time, if you will recall, uh, we talked about St. Augustine's teaching on how salvation works. Right? And in particular, how that teaching develops uh, in his conflict with Pelagius and Pelagianism, which grows out of uh, his interactions with the Donatist and the Donatist controversy, uh, and then also more broadly his own experience, the own context of his time. We talked about how all of those things work together to produce August, Augustine's uh, sort of unique perspective on how salvation works, which was of course then very influential uh, throughout the remainder of church history. Uh, and of course, um, I don't think we talked about this last time too much, but um, like a lot of these heresies, right, Pelagianism uh, isn't primarily driven by uh, its namesake, right? So Pelagius certainly played an important role uh, at the outset of the controversy. Uh, Pelagius, uh, the person, uh, gets condemned uh, both by a whole range of bishops and, and the Pope, uh, and then ultimately in the Council of Ephesus. Um, but there are a whole of, host of other figures who um, adopt some or all of Pelagius' ideas and try to argue for them. Uh, we talked a little bit about this last time with the semi-Pelagian controversy, which again, as I mentioned, there are a lot of scholars who don't like that title. They think it, it creates this sort of uniform movement uh, when there wasn't really um, any. Um, but there is certainly uh, a number of people kind of throughout the Christian world uh, in the century or so um, after Augustine's life uh, who certainly resist at least some of his ideas, right? So John Cashin, uh, is probably the most famous of these, right? The, the very important monastic figure uh, in Western Christianity. Um, and he certainly takes um, issue with some of Augustine's ideas in terms of the, the limitation on human free will uh, and, and our inability to actually um, do good without sort of very direct guidance uh, and motivation by divine grace working in us. Uh, and so a number of people particularly monastics, um, take issue with that. And a lot of that is sometimes referred to as semi-Pelagianism. Um, now again, some of the more extreme Pelagian or more extreme semi-Pelagian ideas get condemned uh, at, the, at a regional council, the Council of Orange, um, along with uh, sort of the most extreme uh, ideas that you could get from St. Augustine. Uh, in particular, uh, some people working on what Augustine says about salvation um, argue for a double predestination, right? So that um, in addition to sort of looking at that group, that, that mass of human sinfulness and damnation and picking out certain people to save, which we call um, election or in, in more Protestant terms, we call predestination. Um, this idea of double predestination means that God doesn't just look at a humanity that has damned itself and Adam and chooses to save some, but that rather kind of before anyone comes into existence, he predetermines both who will be damned uh, and who will be elected and ultimately saved, right? So that um, God is sort of predestining people to damnation and not just predestining to save some out of humanity that has damned itself. Now, that's a fairly subtle distinction on one level, uh, and there are places in Augustine where he, he comes very close to saying that, if not saying it explicitly. Um, but that idea is rejected by the church, uh, and Pelagianism, uh, at least in its kind of more um, straightforward forms, is rejected as well. Um, and after that, after the Council of Orange, it kind of becomes um, the working model of the church to use a sort of modified Augustinian way of thinking, right? So that uh, we would insist on a lot of what Augustine says about the necessity of grace and the effects of original sin, uh, but in practical terms, we also allow for uh, obviously a role for human free will, a role for uh, merit, and so on. So that, that's kind of just sketching out the bigger picture and jumping a little bit ahead of where we want to look today. But I just kind of wanted to make sure that we had that sketched out um, before we move completely from uh, the discussion of Augustine's conflict with Pelagius and Pelagianism. Um, now, at the end of Augustine's life, um, long before we get to the, the Council of Orange and all of that, um, Augustine uh, continues this fight not just with Pelagius, um, who gets condemned by the Pope uh, and condemned by uh, the Council of Ephesus ultimately, uh, but another prominent figure really kind of engages with Augustine out of this movement, uh, 
Uh, and he's a, a figure known as Julian of Eclanum. Right, so Julian of Eclanum um, what was a, a bishop. Uh, so he's a bishop in Italy. And he is um, really the person who kind of takes up the mantle of Pelagianism after Pelagius and really uh, produces the most challenging arguments for Augustine to uh, deal with in the final years uh, of Augustine's life. Um, so just to give you a little sense of, of the story of Julian of Eclanum, uh, he is a married bishop, um, and so we are at a point still here in church history where <laughs> clerical celibacy is not uh, the mandatory requirement that it is in most of Western Christianity, uh, at least in the Catholic Church today. Right, so uh, he is a married bishop, which was not um, this huge uh, scandal in that day. It was, uh, it was certainly an accepted possibility, um, although certainly there are people working to promote this idea of mandatory uh, sort of universal celibacy for the clergy. Um, but Julian uh, is made a, a bishop uh, in 417, I believe, um, and he uh, is a very educated person. Uh, there's a lot of good things said about him prior to his uh, battle with St. Augustine. But when uh, Plagius gets condemned by the Pope at the time uh, in, a, in, a, in a letter, in a decree, uh, Julian refuses to sign up. Uh, he refuses to uh, co-sign, if you will, this condemnation of Pelagius. Uh, and this starts him on a trajectory of conflict with the hierarchy, and he ultimately dies uh, condemned and in exile uh, a number of years later. Um, but during that time of, of conflict, uh, he writes uh, a number of works against Augustine, against Augustine's ideas, and defending Pelagius's ideas. Um, now, some of these things are the kind of arguments that we've already looked at and talked about in our readings from the last module and in talking about Augustine's idea of how salvation works versus Pelagius's, right? So, um, Julian is going to echo Pelagius in, in arguing against Augustine's idea of original sin as having this disastrous effect on humanity. Uh, he's going to see the effects of original sin as much more minimal and mostly in terms of a, a bad example that we as human beings are born into and, and a corrupting culture. He's going to argue for the ability for us to live, um, avoiding sin uh, in a way that Augustine thinks is impossible. But one of the, the particular things I want to look at here in our discussion in this module is um, Julian, perhaps not coincidentally, as a married bishop, um, argues very pointedly with St. Augustine when it comes to his views of sex and marriage. right? And so um, we didn't talk about this particularly last time, but in this module, um, uh, this is the, one of the main things I want us to consider, is that when Augustine develops his teaching uh, on the effects of sin and how sin is passed on to all of us from Adam, um, connected with that is a particular way of thinking about sexuality and marriage, right? And so uh, from St. Augustine's perspective, uh, like a lot of the other things we talked about last time, this draws together a number of different uh, strands of his thought, a number of different factors in his life come together to produce his teaching on um, sex and marriage, right? So um, we have certainly um, kind of in, in the, the, the side that would lead him to take a negative view towards sex and marriage, uh, there's a number of factors at work there, right? One thing obviously is his own personal experience, right? That he has found um, sex and uh, marriage, uh, those, those issues there, right? To be a, a very significant challenge in his own experience, right? So um, if you'll remember, uh, what's the uh, understanding of sin um, that remains even after our baptism? It's this idea of concupiscence, right? That we are, um, as fallen human beings, we have a tendency to desire things in a way that is in excess. We have a tendency to desire things in a way that uh, disrupts uh, our true good and, and leads us to turn away from more important things, right? And this uh, it goes all the way back to Athanasius as well, that what is sin is sin is turning away from higher things to focus on lower and often cases bodily pleasures and desires. Right? And so for um, Augustine, sexuality and sexual desire uh, is the perfect example of this. Right? It is something that he has experienced personally um, that he desires out of its proper order that has led him away from pursuit of and contemplation of higher things. Uh, and so there's going to be a natural tendency for him to have a negative view towards sexuality, sexual desire, uh, and even marriage. Um, and so that's certainly a factor is this 
um, personal experience. But of course that is tied up with when we looked at Athanasius and Augustine, uh, it's connected with the philosophy of the day as well. Uh, that there's this general neo sort of platonic view of reality where things that are spiritual or things that are intellectual are by their nature higher and better uh, than things that are bodily, right? And so that what one ought to do is to um, more and more through life turn away from bodily things and focus more and more on spiritual and intellectual things, right? And there too, there is going to be a tendency to uh, at least minimize the goods of the body, including uh, sexuality and marriage, um, which are of course bodily realities, but there's also the added factor there, of course, that these are bodily realities that in fact generate more bodies, right? And so sexuality has a particular um, negative connotation towards it uh, in, in a lot of this Neoplatonic thinking. Uh, so that's a factor. But of course, it's not just in the philosophy, right? If we look at um, even in scripture, right, we can find this theme in a number of places, right? So when St. Paul writes to the Corinthians, um, uh, now again, this is a very uh, carefully worded passage in Paul, and it's something that's worth studying uh, because I think it's, it's not just a straightforward condemnation of sexuality or marriage, and far from it, but that being kind of put off to the New Testament class for now, um, Paul does make it clear that he thinks that celibacy is a, a higher calling, right? That um, while sexuality within marriage can be a good thing, um, that he would argue that uh, it is a better thing, if one can, to avoid uh, sexuality, to avoid um, all of the things connected with that marriage and sexual desire, and ultimately, of course, um, children, and that we would be better off focusing our attention on divine things rather than sex and marriage. So you have the philosophy, you have uh, passages in scripture, you have Augustine's own experience, um, all of these things um, working together to um, lead him to have a negative view of uh, sexuality and marriage. Uh, and then we add into this mix um, how his teaching on sin and salvation uh, fits with all of that, right? Because uh, again, remember that in Augustine's uh, understanding of it, all of humanity uh, is just drastically affected by original sin, right? That it not only renders all of us kind of guilty and in a broken relationship with God in sort of legal terms, but that we also inherit uh, a highly corrupted human nature, right? That the human nature that we have is one that is crippled by original sin, at least until we receive the grace of baptism. Um, and so, we get this human nature that has been affected by Adam's sin, well, you know, how does one get that corrupted human nature? Where does that come from, right? Certainly, obviously, we're not getting it from our soul, um, which God kind of creates for us at the moment of our conception, um, but we're not getting uh, our, our corruption and our sin in our nature from that way. How do we get the sin and corruption that is part of our human nature? Well, we get it through, um, through the, generation of our bodily um, body, right? So, uh, our bodily body, that's a very just beautiful phrase I put together there. Uh, but through sex, through procreation, the body is generated and it therefore must be through that process that the sin and corruption gets passed down. And so that is going to, of course, um, lead Augustine to see sexuality and procreation uh, in, in a negative light to the extent that it is the conduit through which we get original sin uh, and that corruption of our nature. Uh, and of course, if you think too, you know, what is, what is it that defines the sinfulness of human nature, right? It is um, the fact that our, our desires and our body does not uh, respond to the direction of our intellect and the direction of our intellect towards higher things, right? And Augustine sees um, sexuality is kind of the prime example of that, right? This is a, a an aspect of human nature that is really not within uh, rational control. Uh, and this doesn't even require, of course, for one to be uh, engaged in all sort of extramarital fornication, right? Obviously, in those cases, you are acting contrary to reason. But Augustine, uh, you know, we're all, all grown-ups here. Um, Augustine looks at the way that sexuality happens, the way sex works, 
Uh, and it is not a purely rational uh, directed process. This is a process that involves emotions and passions and desires, even when it is done within the proper context of a marriage. Uh, and given that nature of it being kind of outside of rational control, Augustine is going to see that as a, a disruptive and a bad um, influence and, and a bad aspect of sexuality that's really inseparable from sex uh, itself. And so that is, too, going to lead Augustine to um, have a very negative attitude towards sexuality. So we've got all of these things uh, producing this tendency in Augustine to take a very negative view of sex and marriage. Now, before we kind of get to what Augustine's view is, uh, it is important to recognize that those factors are at work in, in other figures in this period as well. Uh, and in fact, as we mentioned uh, in the previous module, you get some very vigorous condemnations of uh, sexuality and just even normal married life from various figures uh, in this period. Uh, so in particular, uh, St. Jerome um, pens some, some very uh, challenging works when it comes to marriage, right? And he, Jerome essentially, uh, in his defense of the, the goodness of the ascetic and celibate life, uh, depicts marriage as, as not just a lesser good, but essentially as a, as a bad thing, right? That Christians uh, really ought not to be married, and that if you are a married Christian, this isn't just a lesser good, this is in fact um, essentially a bad thing, right? That you cannot be a good Christian and choose and live within this married state. Um, so again, that we mentioned last time, uh, this figure of Jovinian and Jovinianism, uh, and so in his response to Jovinian, um, Jerome makes those arguments uh, and really uh, comes very close to just a complete condemnation of sexuality and marriage. Uh, and again, that was sort of in the air at the time, if you will. There are these other dualistic ideas that we've talked about before, like Manichaeanism, um, which would see anything related to the body uh, and to sexuality as, as bad and part of the corrupt um, evil side of reality as opposed to the light and spiritual. And so Jerome seems to have at least that tendency in some places. Uh, so now Augustine, uh, experiencing all of this, thinking all of this, sees what Jerome and, and figures like him are saying about marriage, right? And Augustine actually aims to strike, I think you could argue, a balance between these two, right? So he, he wants to um, insist on uh, the fact that there are um, a lot of these connections with our sinful nature, our fallen nature, uh, with sex and marriage. But he also doesn't want to go as far as, say, Jerome does, right? Because, again, Augustine is committed to rejecting the Manichaean, and Manichaean dualism, right? Augustine, uh, in his arguments with the Donatists, develops this understanding of the physical sacraments as a way that God really works in our lives as the way that God really gives grace to us, right? So the physical world is not a bad thing for Augustine, right? And we will look at, in an upcoming module, uh, Augustine's understanding of Genesis and creation, right? And Augustine sees physical creation as a good thing. Again, contrary to the Neoplatonic view of the physical world as, as a corrupt or fallen thing um, by its very nature of being physical, Augustine is going to say, no, that God's creation is a good creation. Having a physical reality is a good thing. Uh, and to that extent, that sexuality and reproduction and marriage um, are good things as well. Right? So he's going to say, Jerome is taking this too far, even if sex and marriage are very dangerous and are tied up with our sinfulness as human beings. We can't go as far as the Manichaeans uh, and say that it's all sinful and corrupt uh, because God creates the physical world. God works through the physical world. And therefore, these things are good. Uh, and so he's got to strike a balance there in the middle between uh, these extremes that are floating around out there. Uh, so in Julian, uh, in his argument with Julian is where this happens, right? Because Julian of Eclanum uh, is arguing for um, the idea of marriage being um, not contaminated in the same way by uh, the sin and effects of original sin that Augustine sees there. So Julian argues for an understanding of marriage that would uh, maybe not go as far as Jovinian in, in making it completely equal to the ascetic celibate life, 
Um, but he sees it as, as a good thing and not as a sort of tainted, dangerous good thing uh, as Augustine does. Uh, and that's really where um, Augustine is going to uh, come out, I would argue, um, in all of this, right, is that he's going to insist on, yes, marriage and sex and reproduction are, in their original nature at least, good things. Uh, and people who are Christian can enter into the married life and live a married life and have children, um, and that all of that can be good. But he is also still drawn by all those factors we were talking about before, and so um, he, he lives, leaves the smallest window of goodness, I think you could say, possible. Uh, and he sees and talks about sex, uh, even within marriage, as, a, as at least a very dangerous thing and as something that is sort of inseparable from all of the effects of sin and effects of original sin that plague our lives. So that's kind of the, the broad outline of this debate. So what I want to do uh, is to not maybe have quite as much video this time uh, and really give you some more time to read through these things yourself. So I'm going to give you um, two um, excerpts from Augustine's work that I would like you to take uh, a look at uh, and to work through all of this yourself and see what you think of it. Um, so the first is uh, an excerpt from um, a work he writes uh, against um, Jovinian, but also against uh, Jerome. So he's writing, specifically addressing that fight between them. Uh, he writes a work on the excellence of marriage. Um, and so there he's going to spell out um, why marriage is in fact a good thing, but he's also going to uh, argue with Jovinian and say it's not as good of a thing as Jovinian thinks it is, but it is a better thing than Jerome thinks it is, essentially. And so in that work, he, he's going to spell that out. And it's not very long, so you can read the whole thing without too much trouble. Um, so I'll ask you to take a look at that. And then uh, in the uh, other work I'm going to give you is part of his uh, interaction with Julian. Right? And so in his uh, multiple works against Julian, some of which he dies before he finishes, um, he addresses this topic as well. Uh, and there he's, he's arguing, this is a, I think you could say, a ch more challenging argument for him, right? This is what consumes him at the end of his life. And he's going to spell out against Julian, who's kind of defending marriage as just a clear, uh, unsullied good. Uh, Augustine is going to give his much more hesitant endorsement of marriage uh, and argue against Julian's much more positive assessment there as well. So I'll give you uh, some excerpts from Augustine's work on that controversy to look at as well. And so then what I'd like you to do is to take these together uh, and, and try to formulate, you know, what does, what does Augustine see um, as uh, the goodness or badness of uh, sex and married life and, and procreation? Right? Is, it, um, is he successful in trying to strike this balance between avoiding the, the dualism that you see in some figures um, while also um, taking proper account of the effects of, uh, of sin and uh, how that changes our experience of sex and marriage, uh, which Jovini and others seem to fail to recognize, and which Augustine would argue that Julian fails to recognize as well. So is he successful in doing that? Right? And of course, what you're going to see when you work all, through all of this is that I think it's going to be inevitable that there will be some tensions between what you find Augustine arguing for and, and what uh, would be more modern uh, Catholic teaching and certainly more modern, uh, broadly speaking, Christian teaching on sex and marriage. And so I'll ask you to kind of put together in your own words what is it that Augustine thinks about sex and marriage, uh, and then to think at least a little bit about how does that correspond to or contrast with uh, our more current contemporary teaching on these topics. Uh, and so that's really what I'd like us to focus on today. I want you to really spend some time there in Augustine mulling through what he has to say. Um, I think you will find it interesting uh, and also challenging uh, for those of you who have uh, small kids and maybe want to avoid awkward conversations, but maybe not. Um, you know, if you print out these readings, you might not want to leave them laying out on the dining room table because they do get into some, some details um, that you might not want to discuss over dinner. Um, but it might be an interesting place uh, or topic of discussion if you have some older children where it would be appropriate to go through these things. So anyways, uh, I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this. I think it's a, a very interesting, 
uh, and also challenging topic, but it's certainly a place where Augustine has had a huge influence on the tradition following him. So I think it's important for us to get a sense of what it is that he really teaches about all of this. So um, take some time and look at that, and I'd be very interested in hearing your thoughts on it.